Dear God, we thank you for <clears throat> our life and all the many blessings that you've poured out for us. And <clears throat> we even thank you for the hardship that you've provided sometimes to teach us so that you could build us up into the kind of children that you want to have with you eternally. We pray that the little bit of time that we spend here on Tuesday nights could contribute something <clears throat> to our development as Christians, um, that you'd teach us something tonight that really helps us, each one of us, maybe a different thing to each person, but something that makes it worth the time that people come here, not spend to come here and open up your word and to read, Lord, please speak to each of us tonight. As always, I ask that you would be our teacher and our protector against mistakes. We hope everything that happens here is pleasing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. For my... So <clears throat> we're in the gospel according to Luke. I think everybody's been with us for a long time. Last week we started chapter 5 covering the first 11 verses. This week we begin in verse 12 of chapter 5 and we'll cover as much as we can by 9 p.m. This is an outline which I've now used at least three times, um, so I'll spend almost no time reviewing it. This is the outline of the stuff we studied between the beginning of Luke's Gospel and verse 13 of chapter 4, all of which are things which happened before Jesus began his adult ministry. And so for, for those of you who, who missed classes or want to go back and review any of this stuff, please do take advantage of the fact that it's all up on, on YouTube. And as much as possible, we should all try to bring what we learned in these introductory materials with us as we read on into the gospel, because Luke very carefully put all of this information, precisely this information, at the beginning so we would have it quickly so that we could understand other things in light of it. Jesus' ministry begins in Luke's Gospel in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 4, as I've reviewed several times before. And I just, for some reason, feel inclined to keep reemphasizing to myself and to you that Jesus' ministry begins at a certain time and a certain place in the, the world and in human history. Um, and, and while this is the greatest thing that happens in the history of the universe, um, it's almost hidden in, in this one man Jesus, in this tiny little place of Galilee where, where this story starts out, in just some of the cities around there at a time 2,000 years ago, and yet this is what affects our lives in, in the greatest possible way. It's amazing that God would become a man and walk among us in this way. And so now that Luke has us going in Jesus' ministry, he begins, and we've studied um, several episodes, I think three episodes, if I could call them that, in the early ministry of Jesus. The first one that Luke wanted to tell in order was the story of how Jesus was rejected in his hometown, in his home synagogue by his home people. The people who knew him best were the people who rejected him first and most violently. Partly because they did know him best, hence Jesus' words about a prophet never being accepted in his, in his home country. And partly also because Jesus refused to perform signs and miracles there or to do anything else that was in any earthly value to the people in, in Nazareth, and finally they became angry with him and they, they chased him away, or more precisely, they were trying to kill him, but he walked away because he had the power to do that and it wasn't time for him to die yet. The second episode that Luke wanted to arrange for our education was at first seemingly the opposite example of how Jesus was wildly accepted in the nearby town of Capernaum. 
And there I think it's probably a little bit too simple to say, but basically fair to say that Jesus was accepted there because he did so many miracles. He cast out demons and almost everybody in town brought their sick relatives to him and he, and he healed all of them until finally they would have held him with them forever if he hadn't used that same power that let him flee safely from Nazareth, to, you know, because they were trying to kill him to flee safely from Capernaum because they were trying to keep him because as Jesus explained near the end of this episode, it was his job to proclaim the kingdom of God in all of the other cities. And that's, that's what he goes on to do. And in tonight's story, we'll continue reading episodes of Jesus' continued teaching in the other cities around there. But last week, we read what's in, in some ways of thinking a kind of an interruption of this um, because uh, Luke waited until fairly late in his gospel to tell of Jesus' calling of his first disciples. The other gospel authors did that right away at, at, at the beginning, almost at the very beginning, whereas Luke held off speaking of disciples until he had advanced these other themes that I've just been talking about. And then finally at the beginning of chapter 5, the first 11 verses, last week's lesson, we saw Jesus calling his first disciples. And it struck me, and I think I said last week, and I'll say again, that I, one of the reasons why Luke did it, one of the it, um, benefits of Luke's ordering of things is that by the time we read about the disciples, we've already seen how the great mass of people react to Jesus in Nazareth and in Capernaum. And so we can, to some extent, contrast and compare how Simon Peter and James and John reacted to Jesus with the way everybody else has reacted to Jesus. And what we saw was, to make a long story short, they left everything and followed Jesus. And because I think the Bible would have us understand that there are no, no one's good except for God, Jesus said. It's not that Peter and James and John were better than the people in Nazareth or in Capernaum. In fact, there were probably people in Nazareth and Capernaum that were better than they. Probability-wise, it seems likely. But the point is that Jesus will call disciples, effectively call disciples, because he has the power to do that. He has the, the, the ability, the power of the Holy Spirit to, to open the hearts and minds of these men who are going to follow him. And it's really they, rather than Jesus, who will take the news of the kingdom out into the wide world after Jesus has ascended to heaven following his resurrection and his crucifixion. And so we can really appreciate that, in one way of thinking, the calling of the disciples is itself a miracle. I mean, Jesus is telling episodes of sort of miraculous and amazing things that happen. The way Luke orders it, he puts the calling of disciples kind of in the third position. But I would say the calling of disciples is as much of a miracle as anything else that we'll read about. And it's the same miracle that we participate in by becoming followers of Christ who are saved by also being able to see Jesus and to follow Jesus by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So anyway, that's what we studied last week. So now in everything else that follows, you can have it in mind that Jesus has disciples tagging along behind him in most of the things that he does. And so the next episode that we come to is, is tonight's reading, the, the first reading tonight, verses 12 through 16 of chapter 5, which has to do with the story of the time that Jesus cleansed, or if you prefer, healed a person with leprosy, a leper. So, Steve, could you read verses 12 through 16, please? While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. 
Thank you. All right, so Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16, the place where Luke remembers the story of, of the time Jesus cleansed this leper. And if you look at verse 12 of chapter 5, it begins with, while he was in one of the cities. So if you remember my introduction, this is sort of looking back to chapter 4, verse 43, where it said, But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom to God in the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So that's what Jesus has, has set off to, to, to do. This is a, just a continuation of that, and this is another thing that happened in another city while, while he was doing that. And this is typical, like I mentioned last week, how Luke sort of marks off his text with phrases like this to let you know that a new episode is, is beginning. This was while he was in one of the cities. And Luke doesn't care so much about the strict chronological order as the rhetorical order. He wants to tell his stories in a certain way for teaching purposes. And I think he does a really marvelous job of that. Not that it matters what I think. Right? And the, while he was in one of these cities, there came a man full of leprosy. So I think everybody knows um, you know, kind of what leprosy is. In those days, I read that the word here translated leprosy covered a, a very wide range of possible skin diseases that people had. It's not necessarily equal to the modern classification of, of leprosy. But as in recent times, even in the, you know, the 20th century, maybe even some places today, some of the forms of leprosy were frightening because they could be communicable. That you, one person could give the, the disease to another people, per person, and so people were afraid of them sometimes, feared them, shunned them, cut them off from society, and more than one commentator in recent time has compared it to what AIDS was like in the beginning. You know, it's, it's one of those diseases where if people come to know that you have it, and in this case, they can see that you, you have it, then it's like a kind of living death. You're cut off from the nation, you're cut off from people, you live on the fringes of society for so long as you continue to have, to have leprosy. And it had special meaning perhaps for the Jews because as we studied recently when we studied the Old Testament book of Leviticus, there's a couple chapters in Leviticus and elsewhere in the Old Testament dedicated to the, to the ritual impurity that attends leprosy. So not only was there a physical thing people might be afraid of catching, but in Israel, if you had leprosy and the priest said you had leprosy, you were cut off from the temple and from the tabernacle and from the, the ritual practice of, of religion in Israel. And so you, you, know, you couldn't atone for your sins and you couldn't participate in the feasts and the festivals. And so it was like a kind of living spiritual death, you know, if you were a Jew because you were cut off from the, the, you know, the, the activities of the people of, of Yahweh. And, and finally, we should remind ourselves that in 2,000 years ago, people knew nothing about modern medicine or science or biology, and so they didn't know about microbes and, and viruses and, and all that kind of stuff. So when somebody had a disease, if they were looking for the cause of the disease, their mind wouldn't go to a scientific place, mostly. It would go to a magical place or a religious place. So they would imagine that if you had a, a disease like leprosy, then perhaps it was caused by punishment of God, or perhaps it was caused by some sin that you had, or maybe somebody cursed you, or, and so forth and so on. Those ideas would come to their mind much more readily than they do in, in, in Western countries, at least today. And so the people would have even you know, been seen, or even see themselves as having been cursed by, by God or whatever. So this is the kind of person that, that comes into this story. And when he comes, this, this uh, guy who has leprosy, and he sees Jesus, he falls on his face and he starts begging, begging Jesus for, for help. And to me, right away, because the last story we read in Luke's arrangement was the story of the calling of Simon Peter. And I had still the picture in my mind of Simon Peter falling on his knees in front of Jesus and saying, Lord, get away from me, for I'm an unclean sinner. I see at least a physically similar reaction here on the, on the part of, of, of the leper. And there with Peter and here with the leper, the fact that they fall on their knees before Jesus and how they address Jesus with titles like Lord, as, as, as happens here and with Peter also, 
their speech and their behavior communicates to us that they understand something about Jesus uh, and they're according him you know, an extraordinary degree of reverence and, and respect um, and fear, which is the beginning of wisdom when it comes to God and his son also, I think. Fear is probably the, f the first and most intelligent reaction that you, you can have. You realize you're in the presence of the power of God. This guy seemingly does. And he calls him Lord, and he seemingly simply believes, but we don't know how, but by things he's seen or heard, you know, uh, about Jesus, that Jesus is capable of removing leprosy. He, he's, he, he says here, he professes or confesses here, you can make me clean. He, he knows that seemingly. But, and this may be a key point, he does not presume that Jesus necessarily will make him clean, right? He doesn't think that God is some kind of dog that does tricks, you know, on, on demand or Jesus either. This is the sovereign Lord, somehow he feels, however vaguely. And so he understands that it's a matter of God's will. It, it's in some, some sense a matter of God's will that he has leprosy and it will be, in, in a different sense, a matter of God's will if the leprosy is removed. But anyway, he's at the mercy of Jesus. He's at the mercy of God and, and, and all he can do is come to the place where help can be found and say, if you will, you know, in effect, please help me if, if you want to. It's kind, kind of what he's saying. And as we've seen with Peter's mother-in-law and at other places where Jesus happens across innocent people who simply come in faith and ask to be healed, something Jesus wants to help people. He's not on earth to do a global healing ministry, but as he moves around, because he is the Son of God and he, has, he moves in the power of the Holy Spirit and has the ability to heal and cast out demons, he'll do that where people are in need and where people come to him. And so Jesus stretched out his hand, it says in verse 13, and touched him saying, I will, that is, I do want to heal you. And immediately it says the leprosy left him. So we're supposed to see here, like we did in Mark's gospel, front to back, and now again in Luke's gospel, we see how easy it is for Jesus to do all, all of these things. Leprosy, or demons, or whatever was the fever that Peter's mother-in-law had, and all these other things. These are just anomalies in God's good creation. You know, the, the universe was created through Jesus, we'll learn later as we reflect on it more. Jesus and his father are the creators of the universe. They created the universe good, but sin entered the world with Adam and Eve, and there's all kinds of sin and evil and corruption in the world now. That's the world that we live in, just like the devil told Jesus in the wilderness, it's all been given to me, you know, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give it back to you. But wherever Jesus is on this earth, during his time on earth, wherever he's standing, the kingdom of heaven is there. And so, with, he, he wouldn't even need to, to move a finger, I think. He could just think a thought or say a word or, or do whatever he wants to do, but he has the power and more than, more than enough power to command every evil thing to just vacate, right? Including this leprosy. And we don't know whether they think of demons and leprosy as somehow related or different or whatever. It doesn't matter. Any evil thing that there is, anything that harms humans or nature, Jesus has absolute power to, to overthrow, and, and he does it, does it here. The more amazing thing maybe than the fact that Jesus could make the leprosy go away, at least in the eyes of the people who are watching, is that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched this guy. Right? And if you're a Jew and you grow up reading Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all the things that talk about ritual impurity and separation from God because of unclean skin diseases and all of that kind of stuff we studied in Leviticus, that this man, this holy man, Jesus, would actually just simply reach out and touch the man, the, this leper, and, and heal him in that way, must have been quite astonishing people. He, he just basically zeroes out all of the evil that there is and just makes the man, makes the man well with, by touching him. And it's probably important that he chose to touch a leper because that's the one thing nobody would ever do to, to a leper. And then after he did it, and Mark says, the same thing in Mark's gospel, Mark said it more 
abruptly and strongly. Luke tones it down and makes it more gentle. But in both cases, we, we come to understand that, that Jesus wanted this guy not to immediately run around and tell everybody what had happened, that he'd been cured from leprosy, which people would readily see. In Luke, we get the sense, at least what Luke is saying, there's something more important that you need to do first. Because you, you had leprosy, you were cut off from Israel according to the laws of Moses, you're cut off from society. Everybody who touches you becomes unclean also right now because according to the laws of Moses, you're still unclean because under the laws of Moses, the way to become clean again is to go to the temple and go to the priest and go through the procedure, which takes a week or something. I've, I've forgotten now, to be honest, when we studied Leviticus, but it takes time to go through the process and finally have to offer a sacrifice and be declared clean and so on. So all of that is still necessary to, to, to be in obedience to the laws of, that God hand, handed to, to, to Moses. And, and Jesus is very careful, um, although sometimes not in the way that the, the scribes and Pharisees think he should be, but Jesus is in his own way careful about obeying the laws of, of Moses. So I think, and, and there are other people may have slightly different opinions, but I think the main point here is that to, leprosy is a social cutting off and it's a religious cutting off. This guy was completely separated from Israel. Now he's physically fine because Jesus can easily heal him. But there are rules that say how he can come back into Jewish society. And, and, and for Jesus' healing miracle to be completed, he has to go through that. Jesus can't do that for him. Because the way to do that is stated in the Torah. And the guy has to go through the procedure to do that before he can come, come back in. And it may also be uh, to, to some people in the priest a testimony of the power of Jesus and some other things which people would, would point to. But anyway, Jesus is not, didn't do this miracle for the purpose of advertising it. He did it because the guy asked him and, and he did it. Nevertheless, of course, news of this kind of thing gets, gets out. In Mark's gospel, it says that the, that the man, when he was healed, specifically disobeyed Jesus and went and told people anyway. Luke doesn't say so. Luke just says that the report about him got out somehow, went abroad, and it just added to the crowd problem that Jesus is already having. We've already seen that. Jesus was pushed up against the lake by the crowd and he had to get into the boat, last week's story, when he called Peter and James and John. This week, or I mean, in the story that follows, Jesus is so crowded in that some guys bring somebody to be healed and they have to take off the roof and lower the guy down, you know, through the roof on the ropes. We get the feeling that Jesus is just, whenever he, people know where he is, he's just mobbed because people have many needs and he has the power of God to, to provide. And so people will, dare I say, selfishly go there. I mean, that's where the goodies are, where, where Jesus is. And so they will, they will go there, and probably for some good reasons, good reasons as well. So it says now that here that you know, people are gathering to hear him, but it says, and to be healed of their infirmities. And I, I, spec, I sort of speculate <coughs> that Luke is trying to get across to us that there was always this danger of Jesus' gospel ministry, of, of proclaiming the kingdom of God in all the cities, was in constant danger of being smothered by a healing ministry that tried to follow him because people were interested in the healing stuff, most, maybe most of, most of all. Okay. So Jesus would occasionally escape the crowd by withdrawing, by taking himself out to desolate places, that means places where there's nothing, the wilderness. And when he was there, he would talk to God, his father, that is, pray. And I, it struck me today as interesting that it's, it, it's interesting that right after Jesus was baptized and God claimed him as, as his beloved son and the Holy Spirit came on him in all of its fullness, the Holy Spirit took him out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And there he, he was like bulletproof. I mean, there's nothing the devil could do to cause Jesus to sin and the devil gave up and retreated for, for, to fight another day. But now <clears throat> when Jesus is <clears throat> mobbed by people looking to be, to be healed and for other things they're looking for, he withdraws to that same place, to the desolate place, to the wilderness, because that's the place where he can be alone with, with God. 
And I guess what's interesting to me about that is it just gives a picture that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they have absolutely no trouble managing the devil and demons and sickness and anything evil. It's totally easy for them because they have so, so much power to, to simply push it away. But what's difficult, if I can say so, for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is saving human beings from sin. That's a challenge worthy of God. I mean, they, they, they really have, have a hard time. You know, uh, the, the, the triune God really has a hard time saving us because it, they, God has to do everything to save us, right? He has to regenerate us. He has to open our eyes. He has to make sure that the, the word is received by us and understood by us and that Satan doesn't pick the word out of us and so forth and so on. And so I think Jesus was probably really tired sometimes and he, he probably needed to go out into the wilderness and just be alone with God and think and re, you know, sort of recharge. Okay. And maybe what I just said about Luke sort of at this point in his, his presentation thinking, wow, Jesus is in danger of being swallowed up by a healing ministry so that he can never tell the gospel. Maybe that's why Luke chooses next the story that comes next. Because the next story is the one about the time when some guys brought their friend and lowered him down through the roof because Jesus was so swamped by people. And the subject that's mainly in view here during this story is the connection between healing and the forgiveness of sin. I mean, the, the message of the kingdom of God is fundamentally about the forgiveness of sin, right? It's, it's about how God is going to make a way where there seemed to be no way to forgive us of our sin and bring us back into fellowship with him, um, which has been broken since Adam. That's the main mission. But at the same time, we live in a world with lots of sick people and demon-possessed people and poor people and hungry people, and so there's all kinds of miracles that God can do to, to help people who need help. And there's a kind of a tension between those two things going on all the time, and we see that in this, in this story. People are willing to accept Jesus' miracles, but they're much less willing or much less able to accept Jesus' forgiveness. <laughs> That's more confusing to them because it's less obvious that they, they, they need that maybe. So that's the story we're going to read next. So, Tuniko-san, <clears throat> our reader is... Why was I miss? I don't know. Could you read Luke 5, <laughs> 17 through 26, <laughs> please? I'll be happy to. And I'll, I'll try to be more entertaining. <laughs> No, no, no. It's, uh, I am uh, well, um, well, well, uh, well reminded. Okay. 17 through 26. My pleasure. Jesus heals a paralytic. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is a 
picture on the PowerPoint of m maybe what it looked like, you know, the things that happened in this story. I used exactly the same picture when we were studying Mark. This is an incident. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all remember this, this, this story with, you know, with slight differences. I think Mark said he had four friends, and here Luke doesn't tell us how many friends it was, and there are some other differences, but it's, it's the same story that the church is re remembering through, through its several sources, mostly following Mark here. Um, and that's, that's sort of what it, what it looks like. You can see, I guess this is Jesus here, and the man, paralyzed man is on the, the stretcher there. And his friends are up on the roof, lowering him down by ropes. And they've taken the roof off of the house because it says that Jesus was surrounded by a crowd. They couldn't get to Jesus through the door. So that's a, a, a good picture of what's going on at this point in Jesus' ministry. You know, wherever anybody can get close to Jesus, they can hear his teaching and, and maybe have a miracle. But he's only one man. He's the Son of God, but he is a human being, and a human being can only be in one place at one time. And so during Jesus' adult ministry, there's going to be a, a, a physical geometric limit to how many people he can minister to. And you can see it, see it here. They don't have electronic things like Skype, you know. Right? So the first verse that Steve read, again, we see Luke begins the episode in a sort of way he, he does. On one of those days, one of the cities, and one of those days, one time, one of these times. So he's, t he's, he's telling somebody, said he's telling history by, by story or by episode. He's, the church remembered this story about Jesus, and that story about Jesus, and the other story about Jesus. And the, the gospel authors are arranging them in a certain order and connecting them together to, to tell a larger story about who Jesus is and what Jesus is, is doing. The next thing that Luke wants to tell us is this, this story. And we find that what Jesus was doing here, but this is what Jesus is doing always, basically. His, his core mission, his root mission is to teach. It happens he casts out some demons and heals some people and does some miracles and stuff. But um, the main thing he's doing, he told us in, in chapter 4, is he has to go to all of the cities and proclaim the, the kingdom of of God, that's what he's supposed to do, and so that's what he's doing here. It's one of the one of the many days when Jesus was someplace, and we know he sits to teach in all the scenes that we see. But this time, there's something new, and this is a, a new um, <clears throat> element that Luke is introducing here. We've seen how the crowds respond to him. We've seen how disciples respond to him. But now we're going to see how the religious leadership responds to him and it's already gotten past the point where he runs into this or that bible teacher and this or that synagogue and this or that city right now it says that wherever he is sitting teaching that there are pharisees and teachers of the law there and i guess you know that pharisees are, are kind of like a, it's not a, 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 a an office it's like a movement or a um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's like it's it's like a movement. It's a group of people who are very religious, very careful about obeying the the, the law, um, but who are also very um, very faithful. And they believe in, for example, eternal life, and they believe in angels. Unlike the Sadducees, who they're often compared to who are only paying attention to the Torah and who don't really believe in supernatural things and just think that the Old Testament is a way to order their life in this world. The Pharisees are, in fact, rather close to Christians in many ways. Um, the, the, the only difference, and being the most important difference, is that they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the Pharisees are the super holy people. And the Apostle Paul, for example, was a Pharisee before he became Christian, just as an example. And the teachers of the law, those are like scribes, sometimes they're called, people who actually have a, a job in, 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 the, in, the, in the religious hierarchy, in the temple, you know, in the nation. And so they, they have the job of, of teaching or, or, or writing. Um, law. And, and it doesn't matter for our, our purposes today to go into great detail, but 
Pharisees are there and teachers of the law are there. And by the way, some of the teachers of the law are also Pharisees and some are Sadducees. These are not two different categories of people in that sense. You can be a Pharisee and a, and a teacher of the law or, or you can be just a Pharisee or just a teacher of the law. And I think Luke, some people say Luke may not have actually understood that very well because you remember his writing later and, and, and possibly at a, you know, at a time when the temple was in trouble or even gone. And so by that time, by late in the first century, the early Christians would have been dealing mostly with Pharisees who, had, who were inhabiting the synagogues roundabout there. And the teachers of the law and the Sadducees and other people more closely linked to the temple would have sort of lost their, their place. Um, and yet the, the religious fervor of the Pharisees continued on into the early days of the Christian church. Anyway, the guys who are reading Luke's gospel to begin with will understand that Jesus is in the presence of very holy Jewish people. And they're sitting there, and they're sitting there because Jesus is sitting there teaching. And so I was just thinking on the train coming over here, we probably had better wonder to ourselves, you know, what is it that they're hearing Jesus teach there? Um, you know, he doesn't teach about healing. He doesn't teach about demons. He doesn't teach about present prosperity. He doesn't teach about Israel overthrowing the Romans. What Jesus talks about is the restoration of God's people to God, about repentance and forgiveness of sin and turning back to God and the coming of the kingdom of God. And often, as we saw in his home church in Nazareth, as he reads scripture, he comes very close to pointing to himself and saying, I am the fulfillment of, of this law that, that, you, that, that you, you have. He's talking about things like that. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law really understand things like that quite well. They understand their Bible very well. Jesus, we know, is a powerful, authoritative Bible teacher. And so my point is, they will not just be reacting to the, to the, to the miracles or, or to the words that Jesus speaks when he forgives the sins of this guy. They'll be reacting to Jesus' teaching message, which is going around all over the place. And they're sitting there now following Jesus around, listening to him teach. And so part of what they're chewing on is Jesus' teaching, even though I can't tell you exactly what the content of Jesus' teaching you know, would have been to them on, on this day. And it's not just a few of them. It says that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are sitting there. Who They'd come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And so Luke kind of loves these all-inclusive <laughs> statements. He, he wants you to know, like all of the really religious and really scholarly people are there listening, listening to, to Jesus. Um, and then finally, though, although Jesus is teaching and the teachers are listening to him, it is also true, he says, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Now, I personally would guess that the power of the Lord is always with Jesus to, to, to heal, in, in the sense that there, it's not as if sometimes Jesus wants to heal and he can't. I, don't, I just don't really think that's the way I, I read my, my Bible. But on the other hand, we can see that Jesus wasn't mainly out to, to, to do a healing you know, um, exorcism ministry, and he didn't do it constantly. What he did constantly was go from city to city, synagogue to synagogue teaching. And so from the perspective of people who were listening to Jesus and watching Jesus, it might seem to them like sometimes the healing was happening and sometimes it wasn't, because that's true. But that's, I don't think that's because Jesus' power is coming and going. I just think it's because... Actually, Jesus was almost having to escape the healing ministry in order to, to, to teach, is the way I read this in, in, in Luke. But on this day, Luke lets us know there's going to be some healing happen also, not, not just teaching. That's the picture I, I just had up. And then it comes. Verse 18 tells us what it is. And behold, that is, look, here it comes. Some men, we don't know from who, who they are or anything about them really, but some men were bringing a man on a bed, and the man was, was paralyzed. And notice there's a lot of visual description here. Luke could have told the story with less you know, detailed visual description, so it must be important actually for us to take the picture into our mind of what Jesus was seeing. And what Jesus saw, behold, was some men bringing a man on a bed, 
And I guess you could see that the man was paralyzed. Otherwise, why would they be bringing him on, on the bed? And they wanted to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Obvious reason, right? The man is paralyzed. Jesus can heal. They want to bring him in. But they couldn't find any way to do that because of the crowd. And a crowd really would limit a one-by-one -one personal hand, hands-on laying healing ministry. Not everybody would be able to get up to, to Jesus, maybe to, to, for him to, to, to heal them. But these guys were determined. So, so to get around the crowd, they went up onto the roof. And a lot of people say that in those days they had flat roofs and you, you would go up to the roof by stairs and when it would be hot, they would sit up on the roof and stuff like that. And there's actually a lot of debate among commentators about, you know, <laughs> Luke's description of the roof and did it have tiles or did it have, you know, that's I, I don't really care, actually. You know, they, they, cra they crawled up on the roof and they dug through the roof or took off the tiles or whatever so that they could come down to Jesus from, from up above. And then they lowered his bed down through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. So there's like the picture that we saw earlier. So now the man is there. Right in front of, right in front of Jesus. The, it reminds me of that parable where Jesus talks about, you know, if your neighbor knocks on your door at night and he keeps knocking, finally you're going to help him just because he's so annoying. I mean, these guys, they really wanted their friend to be healed. They were willing to take the guy's roof off in order to lo lower their friend down, down to, to to Jesus. And so it says here, I think, meaningfully, Jesus saw their faith. Everybody saw their faith. They took the roof off of the house and they lowered their friend down on, on a mattress. They probably carried him from, from far away and we don't know how he heavy he was, but they, they really were determined in order to bring their friend and lay him before Jesus, no matter what it, what it takes. So some people would say, well, yeah, Jesus could see their minds or Jesus could see their heart. That's true, and later we'll see words to that effect, but... Jesus, just, just in an ordinary way, Jesus could see their faith by what they, what they did. They were a picture of faith. And they were a picture of faith in Jesus. They weren't trying to get in to just see a random healer. They were trying to get in to see Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. Right? And so because of the, the faith that they demonstrate by trying to bring their friend in, his sins are forgiven. And this is not like a 1960s, you know, movie. Man, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's like, man, <laughs> your, your sins are forgiven. Hey, man, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> no, I don't think that's the way to read it. So, and, and so, you know, min, many people have, have noticed that it's the faith of the men who brought the, the man, it's plural. Their faith means more than one. It's not just the faith of the man who's healed. It's the faith of several men. I would argue the man who was healed and also his friends who brought him. They were all in on it. They all went through a huge ordeal, cooperating, as it were, the paralyzed man by agreeing to be carried in and maybe asking his friends to take him, his friends by doing all the stuff they had to do to carry the, the man in. They're all demonstrating their faith in Jesus' ability to, to heal. But then Jesus surprisingly says just to the man, which is probably the, the, the man on the, on the bed, your sins are forgiven. And so as you might imagine, over the centuries, people have talked a lot about, well, why, why would the faith of the men who carried him have anything to do with the fact that the man was healed? Shouldn't it be his own faith that matters? And there are actually a lot of examples in the Bible of times when people are saved because of the faith of their friends. And, and there are even teachings in the Bible that say that the prayer of a you know, godly man will avail much and so forth. I mean, I, th I think blessings are sometimes given by God because people pray for, for, for other people. The faith of your praying grandmother or the faith of your prayers, you know, the, in, in your prayers for your unsaved spouse or whatever it is. God answers all kinds of prayers. And so there's nothing strange, really, <clears throat> that, that God should answer the prayers of 
the, or notice the faith of this guy's friends. <clears throat> and I personally think if faith and forgiveness of sins go together, then probably all of them get, are, are forgiven, you know, the same and no differently, whether the guy was paralyzed or whether he was a friend carrying the guy anyway. They were all showing faith, and, and perhaps all of their sins are forgiven. But the reason why they came there, the thing that demonstrated their faith, the center point of this whole story that Luke is telling, is the man on the bed who was paralyzed and what Jesus does about that. And so I think Jesus just speaks to that. That's the center point of the story. The man came to be healed, but Jesus said instead, and surprisingly, your sins are forgiven. And that's what sets up the main part of the story that, that follows. So, so in other words, I can't answer any, if you have lots of questions about whose faith is you know, in, involved in who gets forgiveness. Nobody can perfectly answer that question. And that's not really what this story is about. The story is about what follows next. And, and the whole thing is about, now this is the first time that the scribes and the Pharisees are, are zooming in on Jesus and following him, listening to his teaching, watching him. They've heard what he just said, man, your sins are forgiven. And now in verse 21 we read that the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, <coughs> saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So these are <clears throat> not real questions. These are what we sometimes call rhetorical questions. So if they were real questions, who is this who speaks blasphemies? The answer would be Jesus of Nazareth? You know, as if they were asking who's talking. It's not a real question, right? They, they, they presumably know who he is. They followed him all the way there to sit there and listen to him teach. They know who he is. And they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? And that's not a real question either because it means the answer is only God alone can forgive sins. And that's true. Jesus would agree. Only God can forgive sins. Right. And so the meaning of these two rhetorical questions is when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, it almost sounds like he's saying something blasphemous. Or perhaps he is saying something blasphemous because only God alone can forgive sins. And it sounds like Jesus just said something about the sins of the man on the bed who was paralyzed having been having been forgiven. Right. And so that's, that's got these guys thinking now about Jesus in a way that's disturbing them. And the scribes and the Pharisees begin to question you know, themselves saying, saying these things. And Jesus knows, I don't know whether it's because you can hear what they're saying, but it says in verse, sorry, in verse 22, it says that he could perceive now, it says he could perceive their thoughts and he knows that they're questioning in their heart so he can see, like everyone in the room can see that they're grumbling and they're, they're saying, ah, who, who is this who speaks blasphemy? Only God alone can forgive sins. And Jesus perceives what, what it is they're, they're thinking and what's, what's, bothering, what's bothering them. So what do you think is going through their minds? Um, Jesus perceives their thoughts. He knows the questions in their hearts. We've heard their rhetorical question. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Only God alone can forgive sins. Are they just angry at Jesus? Are they puzzled? Are they confused? all of the above. I mean, remember, this is fairly early in Jesus' ministry, and those guys haven't gotten together and decided to kill him yet. At some point, the scribes and the Pharisees get together and they say, let's kill Jesus, right? After that, my question has no meaning. But this is early days. Jesus is healing people. He's casting out demons. People are following him around. Except in his hometown of Nazareth, where he, where he met a very negative reaction, it seems that the people who are here now are not didn't come to, to, to shoot at Jesus, maybe, or maybe they're just starting to. What do you think? 
I was thinking a little bit from the side of a maybe devil's advocate. Let's you know say kind of more of a positive perspective. So they, I don't know that period of time, but I mean there's maybe prosperity gospel preachers back then too. Yeah. Well, all you need to do is give me all your money, and you be your sins will be forgiven, kind of thing. And so they they may have been kind of hearing that sort of thing and reacting to that without really and this kind of maybe trying to put a charitable angle on them that they may not have been necessarily initially just trying to get rid of Jesus out of jealousy or something like that. But, but maybe. So I mean they, they could and later in ministry they will have a rather pointed hatred of Jesus, right? And then they're really trying to trap him and trick him and get him, right? Yeah. And I, I was just wondering whether it's that's already showing up here or whether it, it's it hasn't gotten to that yet, and and whether it might be less that way. So I, I was thinking like they're thinking, this guy Jesus is a beautiful authoritative teacher, right? They 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 love to listen to him teach. He has power. He has authority. He can cast out demons. He can heal. He can do miracles. John the Baptist, who was famous for calling the nation to repentance for the forgiveness of sins, says, this is the one who's mightier than, than, than me. And what's more, he's just surrounded by hundreds, thousands of people. He's so popular that people are following him everywhere. And so these guys, the, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, are, are probably have all of that on the one side. And on the other side, they hear this guy Jesus say something that sounds almost like blasphemy. Yeah, but I guess, you know, prosperity gospel is something they, they heal somebody. I, I guess, I don't know exactly how they say it, but that yeah, kind of almost a little bit crosses the line there. Yeah, but I mean, this what, what they're objecting to is not anything like a modern day prosperity gospel, because the modern day prosperity gospel says you're going to get lots of stuff in this life if you believe in God. Jesus is exactly not talking about that. Jesus says to the man, your sins are, for, are forgiven. Right? Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to look for, a, you know, it's good sometimes to see, to realize that we all can be Pharisees, so, you know, try to, try to put myself in their, 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 their angle. Or their does, does anybody else, yeah, yeah, does anybody else have a, Steve? It's probably, going back to your original question, the combination of both. Uh, some people probably are asking from a less than honorable approach. Because it says, you know, I mean, let's see. Once again, to re to reread from verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, who is this? who speaks blasphemies. And then verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your heart? Many times in other parts of the Gospels, when, when someone is asking a question, the Gospel writers go through trouble to let you know that if someone is asking an honest question or asking just in a way to try and legally trap Jesus into something, to make him look foolish. So you think that this might be a legal trap? Both. I think at this early stage, and I have no real proof here, I think it's both. There are people that are already thinking, oh, this guy's a threat to my, uh, to my authority. Uh, how, how do I stop him? I mean, why would I be thinking some thoughts when I see someone being healed of a terrible disease, and I'm thinking something. Who can, who can well, say you're that, that hasn't happened yet. I mean, the, the the healing of the disease comes next. But I mean, they're they're what they're what they're hung up on is his saying that your sins are forgiven. So let's say um, I, I I don't disagree with anything you said. Let's let's say I think Jesus would agree a hundred percent. Only God can forgive sins. All right, so if only God can forgive sins, let's try our logic here. And Jesus says to the man, 
Your sins have been forgiven you. How could Jesus know that? Logically, how could Jesus know that the man's sins had been forgiven? Well, that's taking a big step, but I mean, or, or God had to tell him, right? Because if, if, if only God <coughs> can forgive sins, the only way Jesus could know is from God, right? It happens also Jesus is God, but let's not go all the way there. And I don't even know if Jesus, Jesus did not say, I forgive your sins. Jesus said, your sins have been forgiven you, right? He's not pushing that point here, and he, and he, he doesn't. So, but Jesus says, I know your sins, your, your sins have been forgiven you. The only way Jesus could know that, and Jesus would agree, is if God, in effect, told him. He has to have that knowledge from God. So the people must be saying, is this guy claiming to have this kind of relationship to God, that he can actually know that a man's sins have been forgiven. It seems like, it seems like blasphemy. It seems, or this guy has this kind of special relationship with God, right? Either he does or it's blasphemy. In fact, if any normal person said what Jesus said, it would be blasphemy. But, uh, uh, but, if, but if, it, if it were Moses or Elijah or certainly Jesus, anyone who had a very special relationship with God, someone who talked to God, someone who God talked to, a, a prophet or, uh, you know. Um, and it's not just Jesus, right? There have been other figures in, in history that had some special knowledge from God, some word from God, some word of God. But Jesus must be a, a very powerful and important person if indeed he's the kind of person that has a relationship with God that lets him know whether a person sins are forgiven or not, right? So if it's true, he really is a threat to their power, that's for sure, right? If it's false, he really is a heretic. He really is a heretic that, that they need to put down. Right? That's true. I guess Isaiah, what is it, uh, like King Hezekiah, Isaiah explains that he's it's for being forgiven, for example. By, yeah, I think there are a lot of, we could find a lot of examples in the Old Testament where God shares information with, with with prophets, right? But anyhow, Jesus' teaching and his miracles and all of the good stuff about Jesus, as Luke tells this story, have now come to the point where Jesus, already once in his teaching, he said, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and they chased him out of town, right, in Nazareth? Now, he says to a man, your sins have been forgiven you, and they're saying, wait a minute, you know, this guy is claiming an unbelievable authority, right? Something amazing is being, being claimed here. So Jesus, does Jesus go back to them and say, I am God? No. Does he go back to them and say, I am the Son of God? No. Does he go back to them and say, God told me so? No. It's still veiled to some extent. But Jesus comes back at them with, with a hypothetical question of his, uh, with a rhetorical question of his own. So he, he knows what's going on in their mind, probably all dimensions of what we're just talking about. And Jesus says to them this really interesting thing. And he says, which is easier to say? <laughs> Your sins are forgiven you, or B, rise and walk. A, your sins are forgiven you, or B, rise and walk, which is easy. And a lot of Bible commentaries spend several pages <laughs> arguing about, well, which would be easy, it depends on, you know, and you, you can do that, but I, I was, it occurred to me there's a shortcut. These are rhetorical questions, they're not, they're not real questions, right? It, it's, so you, you can penetrate to the point that Jesus is, is, is making here without, without getting sucked into the, to, to the rhetoric. So the, the fact is that only a person who's in communion with God could effectively say, your sins are forgiven you, because only God can forgive sins, as we've already discussed. So only a person who has that kind of relationship with God could effectively say, your sins are forgiven you. But hold the phone. Only somebody who has that kind of relationship with God could effectively say, rise and walk. In fact, for Jesus, both things are completely easy. 
We have story after story after story after story. We can see for Jesus, it's nothing in terms of difficulty. He has no difficulty doing either thing because he has this unique, special communion with, with God. Right? But for any other human being, or almost any other human being, let's say, both things would be impossible, right? You could say it, but it wouldn't be effective. Right? The only way you could effectively pronounce sins forgiven or effectively tell somebody to stand up and walk who's been paralyzed is if you have a very special relationship with, with God. For you, both things are easy. For anybody else, both things are impossible. So the only differentiation between the two that we can make is that if you're pretending, if you're pretending, if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't have such a special relationship with God, but you want to pretend one of those two things, it's easier to pretend to forgive sins because nobody can tell whether you did it, whether, whether it happened or not. It's impossible to pretend rise and walk because everyone will know. <laughs> yeah? no. That's the difference between the two things. But actually, both of them are easy for Jesus, and both of them are impossible for anyone else, but only one of them can you actually see. And so, I, I think that helps with what follows. So, so Jesus says, so that you may know then that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So he does the, not the easier thing or the harder thing. He does the thing that everybody can see. Both are easy for him. He did both, in fact. And the scribes and the Pharisees and John the Baptist even, or you know, almost anybody else in the history of the Bible, nobody could do either one of those things. I will say occasionally you, 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 could, you can see miracles that are done by, by people um, you know, in the power of God, but it is because they have a very special relationship with God, and it's always God's power. That's, that's doing that. And as you said, you know, of course we know as Christians, and Jesus is God. But that's... Luke hasn't tried to go there yet in his, in his gospel. Um, we, we don't need to probably go that far. We just need to know that Jesus' relationship with God is unique. He can tell people, pick up your bed and go home. He can cast out demons. He can heal lepers. And guess what? According to him, anyway, he can forgive sin. Either that's true, and he's so important that people are going to have to reckon with an absolutely unique human being, or that's false, and he's a he's blasphemer. So immediately, of course, always immediately, the, the, this easy for Jesus miracle happens. The guy rises up before them, picks up what he'd been laying on, and goes home glorifying God. So this implies that Jesus did have the power to heal him. And it also implies to us Christians that Jesus also did have the power to forgive his sins. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are probably sitting there filled with confusion about how to process the, the forgiveness of sins point. Does somebody read it differently than that, Steve? Well, I don't. I know we're out of time, Greg, but to answer an earlier part of your question, why do you think Christ said to the paralyzed man and not the friends, your sins are forgiven? We studied this in our class here before, that men at that time in history, a lot of people had the perception that if you have some kind of a disease, it's because of your sin that you're ill. And therefore, specifically, when he said your sins are forgiven, I think it was an object lesson for others. 
that your sins are forgiven. <laughs> yeah, except I don't know. Um, I don't remember how we touched on that when we studied the same story in Mark. But I mean, I, 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 I don't think Jesus is teaching that, that, that every sickness is, is a specific punishment for sin. He's not. Yeah. It's quite the opposite. But because people perceived that as such, he addressed it as such. Yeah, we are we are at a time. So, so it says here, amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, "We have seen extraordinary things today." And so, this is bringing you know the, the, the Luke's role out of Jesus' ministry to, to this crisis point where Jesus is more and more and more and more extraordinary. His teaching is extraordinary. It has authority, power, beauty. His power over the devil and demons is absolute. His ability to heal is absolute. His ability to do miracles of various kinds is constantly amazing people. But now he's advanced a claim that says that not only can he heal physical ailments, but he knows, at least he said he knows when a person's sins have, has been forgiven. And in fact, what Jesus said was more extraordinary than that, right? He said, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so the claim is, is big. So people are either going to have to worship him pretty soon or they're going to have to kill him because anybody who has that power is going to eclipse the power of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and, and, and finally everyone. Right? Anyone who, who has that power is, is finally going to be seen to be God. But for today in Luke's treatment, it's, it's, it's certainly extraordinary. It's a very extraordinary thing they saw. So, does, does anyone have any final comment or question? That being the case, let's pray. Dear Jesus, we can appreciate by what we read in the Bible and maybe a little bit through our own life as well how impossible it is for people to believe in you um, from, from our side and how necessary it is that your spirit would come <clears throat> and uh, take what are dead and lifeless sinful human beings and make us alive again. Help us to see the simple truth about you, which is not simple to see when we're dead. Make us to see it and to know that in you we can find salvation and eternal life. We thank you uh, that um, hopefully everyone here has known you in that way. <clears throat> and we ask you, please, uh, to help us uh, to tell other people about you who you are and, and uh, what you offer um, those who will put their faith in you and follow. Um, please uh, help everybody get home safely tonight. And uh, for those people who couldn't be here tonight for whatever reason, I pray that you'll have your eye on them and maybe bring them back next week. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs>